Let's open our Bibles to the book of Romans 15. Our God is a God of hope. And Jesus Christ plans for us to live a life every day of hope. But the more we go into the prophetic scriptures, the harder it is. Because they're so gloomy. The world to come is headed for such disaster, such decimation, such extinction. It's hard to balance out studying for very long the prophecies of the end of days and living in hope. It's kind of like the Starbucks people. They say, what's wrong with you? You know, why are you not in joy? It's because sometimes things weigh on our hearts. And when we look at the end, it's possible to get weighed down. That's why Paul gives us some great words. He tells the New Testament saints in Romans 15 how to live in the hope that the Old Testament scriptures can teach. Now, it's very special how he says this. And we're going to look at both verses 4 and then on down at verse 13. Because Paul never avoided explaining the prophetic events that were coming. In fact, in the very first epistles that he wrote to the Thessalonians, Paul actually does an exposition of Matthew 24 to them. He talks about the Antichrist, he talks about the desolation of Jerusalem, he talks about all these horrible things we're studying in Matthew 24. But he teaches them that in spite of what's going to happen to this world, that they can lift up their heads, their hearts, and live in hope. And that's what he says in Romans 15 and verses 4 and 13. And I want you to hear Paul balancing these prophetic scriptures of doom with comfort and hope for us to live by. Verse 4 of Romans 15, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, here it is, might have hope. Now zip down to verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's bow together. Lord, as we see the end of days coming, we see them clearly through your word. We don't know just when they're going to occur Because you said the day or the hour, no one knows. But as we see the birth pangs that are going to amplify and multiply and intensify, as we see nearly every one of them that you said would be occurring when you return. And you said the generation that sees all those things will not perish before they occur. Then we want to live in hope. And we pray that you, the God of hope, would fill us with hope that we might abound in hope, that we might be the most hope-filled people on this planet of gloom, and we might not have a false peace and security which the man of sin will promise this world, but true peace, because you're the God of hope. Fill our hearts, quicken our minds, stir our wills, help us to make conscious decisions to do what your word says so that we can learn to live in hope. That's what the Old Testament scriptures are to teach us, how to learn to live in hope. So we ask you to do what you have promised. We want to do what you've told us to do, and that is to open our hearts and surrender our wills and let your spirit have complete control over our lives today so that we can be living in trusting hope in you, our God of hope. And we thank you in the name of Jesus for what you will do in our midst And in his name we pray, amen. I love if you glance back at those verses, those three little phrases. Verse four, might have hope. Verse 13, the God of hope. And then at the end of verse 13, you may abound in hope. Now, how do you get that? It's through the Holy Spirit. He's the energy. He's the power. He's the person that moves in. But what means does he use? Well, look back at verse 4. Because the Hebrew language of the Old Testament is that beginning of verse 4. It says, the things were written before were written for our learning. The Old Testament, the things that were written before, that's, that's the first 
uh, two-thirds or three-quarters of your Bible, were written for our learning. So those Old Testament scriptures in that Hebrew language give us valuable insights into the way that God can cause us to live in hope when the world around us is gloomy, hopeless. When we see the finish line, when we see the end of days, when we see, as I'm going to share today, that all the world bodies are getting this gloomy, worrisome thing. The world is feeling the tremors of what the scriptures talk and call the hoofbeats of the apocalypse, the growing awareness that this world cannot survive if we continue as we're continuing to live on this planet. Well, there are four Hebrew words that give us valuable insights into the way God can make us live in hope. We started a couple weeks ago, I introduced these. Last week we looked at the first one. This week we're gonna look at the second one and I'm gonna take you on a scriptural journey and how to be living in the second variety, trusting hope. But let me just show you where we are because there are four types of hope the Old Testament teaches us and, and Romans 15, 4 says we're supposed to learn. The first is a waiting hope. That's what we talked about last week or a recharging hope. Those that wait on the Lord renew or recharge their strength. That is hope that waits until renewal comes. Uh, I compared it to like the charger for your phone. Uh, I was, I was on so many delayed flights. Uh, I'm glad I didn't fly American because that's you know so big here in Tulsa. I was on United. I mean, I waited four hours for one flight, five hours for another flight. And you know what happens if you don't have your little plug-in charger for your phone? You watch that little battery, because you know I have to talk constantly to Bonnie, because that's why I married her, the one person in the whole world I want to spend all my time with. But I was watching the battery go like that. You know what my phone needed? It needed to be recharged. And that's what kind of hope this is. This is hope that waits. My phone needs to wait until it's connected and it's recharged so it can go on. And that's what we saw last week. Like a charger for your phone, a cradle for your PDA, we plug into God's truth, we believe his word as we wait on the Lord. Then he renews and recharges and refills us with his strength. Now the question I asked you last week Did you wait on the Lord this week, Isaiah 40, 31? Did you let him renew your strength? Or did you just plunge on talking to a dead phone? You know what I mean? Going through life unconnected to the power of God. You know, we have to wait. We have to be still. We have to rest. We have to let him renew us and strengthen us when we're weak. Because we are are dissipating in our strength. And we cannot make it on our own. We need his strength. Have you plugged into God's word? Have you been still before him on a regular basis? Have you gotten your strength renewed? The second type of hope, it's trusting or enduring hope. It's hope that trusts until understanding comes. Now, this is a fascinating Old Testament idea that I'm going to show you that we don't think about because we're in such a hurry. I was in O'Hare and, and people were just running madly in every direction. They get up to the counter and they wait. And they look up there and the departure time keeps changing and changing, and changing. And the same people, as I was tootling along, you know, walking with my little rolly behind me, they're right by me. I find them, one person in front of me in line, sweating, you know, because we don't like to what? Wait. We don't like that. And the Lord is all about waiting. Well, there's trusting or enduring hope, hope that trusts until understanding comes. Now, to, but to, just to preface where we're going, are you unsure... Where you are today as far as God's plan for your life. I mean, are there some areas that you're not sure about? Do you ever wonder where God is headed with what he has planned for your future? Do you struggle with his timing and sometimes you feel trapped like, God, I want to get there. I want to get, you know, through school or I want to get married or, or I'm ready and waiting for those children or, or Lord, when am I going to get launched into ministry? And we just feel trapped and we just don't know what he's doing. Well... If you ever feel that way, then it's time to let God's word show you what to do while you wait. Now, there's lots of waiting in the Old Testament. Remember, these things were written, look at verse 4. These things which were written before time were written for our learning that we, through the patience and endurance of the scriptures, might have hope. There's some people that learned that. Job, Noah, David, Ezra, a whole bunch of others. 
But we forget the rewards that come as we endure, as we wait in hope. And what we're going to see is there's trusting or enduring hope. What that is is you don't forge ahead on your own until you know what exactly that God wants you to do. And so many people just charge blindly ahead. It reminds me, in 1979, when I was just a a college student, I was a driver, I was a courier. I took Bibles into Northern Africa, to Muslim countries. It was a very exciting job. Unpaid, and if I was caught, you know, they disavowed all knowledge. Kind of like, you know, should you accept this mission, we will disavow knowledge. You know, the old Mission Impossible thing we used to watch on Sunday nights. Well, I, I had an international driver's license, and this missionary needed a driver to take a truckload of Bibles back and forth. And so I agreed to do it. And so I had this whole team of people, and this cargo van and we had 6,000 Bibles and I was driving and I would drive all night long thousands of kilometers around some of the most dangerous roads of the world in northern Africa and I remember one time we were in Morocco and we had all those Bibles and we were supposed to deliver them somewhere and everyone was snoring because I was the only driver and I was driving all night long to the squiggly Arabic I couldn't even read and I remember that a sandstorm came up and it just started blowing and it was just blinding and you know no street lights you know what Africa's like and especially Morocco where we were and so finally I mean I just could see less and less until finally I couldn't even see the road and so I was just wondering what to do and I was just praying I said Lord I don't know what to do I don't know where to go I think I'm just going to wait and pray so I just stopped the car on that road in the middle of the night. I mean, I couldn't see anything. I couldn't even pull off. I didn't know where I was. So I just stopped. And I just sat there and I fell asleep. And when it started to get light, I opened my eyes. I couldn't believe it. There was the Atlantic Ocean right in front of me. Because the road had gone like this and I had gone like this. And I had driven right to the beach. And there was a, we're in northern Africa in the desert. There was a, a group of camels walking down the beach in front of me. And we were just sitting like that, facing the water. And everyone was in the back still snoring away. And I thought, thank you, Lord. Wouldn't it have been exciting to have awakened in the ocean? I mean, that would have woke those sleepers up in the back, but it would have gotten the Bibles wet. And you know what? It was just such a lesson for me that sometimes when we don't know what to do, We should stop and wait. And that's what the scripture is about. We're going to look at, well, the third word we're going to see next time, there's clinging or holding on hope. Hope that reaches out and asks for the hand of God to hold on to. Hope that clings to the hand of God is a child that holds on to the hand of their mom in the doctor's office or their dad in the dark woods at night. Clinging hope that says, you're all powerful, you can carry me through. And the question the Old Testament begs us is, when you don't know how you can make it, through life, have you reached up to cling to the one that can help you through? I mean, that's what the Lord talks about, childlike faith. I spent two days with the buddies this week and with all the rest of my family. And it was so sweet when, when we were out in one of the strongest storms they've had in New England. The uh, fellow we talked to, a contractor, said it was the worst nor'easter he'd seen in his lifetime. I mean, it was so strong you couldn't keep the car on the road, which is normal by the ocean. But, you know, when it was scary... What do children do? They don't have to get their Bible and pull out their verse card and meditate on it. They just reach out, I mean, in thunderstorms, in in dark, in fearful times. They reach out. They want to hold your hand. God says, I want you to have that kind of clinging, trusting hope with me. And then the last type of hope is sheltering hope, hope that flees from danger into the loving arms of God. And we're going to see that in a couple weeks. That's the hope that runs for the storm shelters when the disasters of life approach. And it's when we settle in our hearts, there's no place safer when troubles come than fleeing to the open arms of the Lord. Of course, that's the first step of salvation. We have to flee to him as our only hope. And then we keep fleeing to him as the one that will take care of us through life. Well, let's go to Matthew 24 and see why I'm even talking about this. Matthew 24, for those of you just joining us, it's about our fifth time looking at the same verses. Matthew 24, verse 21. That's just to give you a flavor of why I'm going on and on about this hope and why I talked to you about waiting and trusting and clinging and sheltering hope. Because all this wondrously promised hope, Jesus 
gives us in the Old Testament because verse 21 of Matthew 24 says that there's going to be a great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And verse 22 says, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. And basically what the Bible says, it's like birth pangs. It's going to be the same horrific event on the earth. It's just going to get stronger and stronger and faster and closer and more horrible. So that means us who are here before Christ's second coming, before he comes to take us to himself at the rapture, are going to experience, if you've ever been in a hurricane, probably you haven't here in Oklahoma, but boy, in New England, we went through two of them. You experience the outer fringes of that hurricane, even if you're not hit by it. And that's what I think about the church. We're not ready for the the eye of the storm because we're not going to be here in the tribulation but we're not ready for the outer fringes that cause similar destruction and hopelessness and that's why I'm even going through this we're not going to be here during this time I truly believe the force of scripture says that the church of Jesus Christ is going to be taken up as he promised but we're going to hit the fringes as the storm approaches And I don't think in America we're ready for what is possibly going to happen to us before Christ comes to take us to himself. And that's why we need to have hope when we see our world disintegrating. Did you know that America could disappear right off the map and God's program will go on? Would you survive if your house was reduced to 10% of its appraised value today? Would you survive? Or are you hoping in your equity If your stock investments and bond investments and land investments all were reduced by 90%, would you be going around hopeful or would you be like me last week at Starbucks where they say, what's wrong with you? You know, would would you lose hope? Think about it. That's what we study this for, even though we're not going to go through this tribulation because verse 22 says, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. Now, Jesus, his message in Matthew 24 is paralleled by John, his beloved apostle. Look at Revelation 6. I want to show you how John expands on Christ's sermon. In fact, uh, Revelation 6 parallels point by point the seals of Revelation 6 parallel the items that Jesus sees in Matthew 24. And if you want to have a fun study, look at Matthew 24 and fit the seven seals of Revelation in there. And what you get is kind of a technicolor enlargement of what, uh, it's kind of like in the picture, how you can go to Walmart, you know, and take your little picture and just get a little bit of it and blow it up. Well, Revelation blows up and magnifies the, the big picture of Matthew 24. And so when you get to chapter 6, and I want to show you especially what Jesus says in verse 8, I want to show you how bad it's going to get in Christ's sermon of Matthew 24 and verse 22, as John says this in Revelation 6, 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given over them over a fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Wow. Now that's a pretty hopeless scene that in one event, every fourth person on the planet dies. I mean, the tsunami was 300,000. That's really nothing compared to six billion people. This is a fourth That's why it's hopeless. This is just one event. This isn't all. There are more big events. This is just one. That's why it's hopeless. But the approach of this pale rider of verse 8 may be on the horizon, according to the United Nations. Now, they are not a Bible prophecy outfit, I'll tell you that much. But on March 30th of this year, they had a public reading of a report. And I want to read to you their report. This was... The report that was read to the United Nations called the Millennial Commission. And they commissioned 1,360 scientists in 95 countries to assess the planet. So they had the majority of the nations on earth represented by their leading scientific members of their communities. And they were due to an assessment of the condition of the earth. And this is the title of the report. Two-thirds of world's resources used up. Hmm. 
The sound of the pale horse's hoofbeats are getting louder. The human race is living beyond its means. A report backed by 1,360 scientists from 95 countries, some of them world leaders in their fields, concludes that the human race has used up two-thirds of the world's resources. But here's the bad part. This is what the report says. Most of the resources have been used up since World War II. Since 1945. Since the last 60 years have gone by. If you are 60 or older, you have lived through the consumption, according to the scientists of this world, the consumption of two-thirds of the available resources on this planet. And they they chronicle them. I'll go through it. Robert Watson, the British-born chief scientist of the World Bank, the former advisor to the White House, was the one who delivered this report. And he claims that mankind is using up all of our natural resources at too fast a rate. And he produced a six-point indictment against the human race. And this is what this British scientist living in America, he drew up six points of his indictment that say is going to lead to the extinction. Wow. The Bible already says that human life is going to go extinct if God doesn't intervene. But now the world community is saying extinction of the human race is coming for six reasons. Let me read to you what they are. Number one is land overconsumption. Because of human demand for food, fresh water, timber, fiber, and fuel, more land has been claimed for agriculture and mining in the last 60 years than in the 18th and 19th centuries combined. 24% of the Earth's land surface is now cultivated, and they say there isn't that much more to just go wholesale and plow up and use and strip and rape it to get what you want, like strip mining and everything else does. Number two, water overconsumption. Water withdrawals from lakes and rivers, as well as the aquifer, you know, the underground fresh water that is, is in uh, such value here and in other parts of the world. Water consumption has doubled in the last 40 years. Humans now use between 40 and 50% of all available fresh water running off the land. In other words, they're capturing 40, 50% of all rain, all snow, and they're also deeply sucking out of the aquifer all the fresh water that's possible. And if we continue at this overconsumption of water, there's not gonna be anything to pull out to run off and to use. Thirdly, the ocean overconsumption. Since 1980, 35% of the mangroves have been lost, 20% of the coral reefs have been destroyed, another 20% are near destruction, and we say, so what? I don't like coral and I don't live near the ocean. But the problem is that if you think of the earth as kind of like a terrarium or an aquarium and you've got it sealed, you've got to have everything functioning on the inside for the life to continue. And if you don't have the coral reefs and the vast plankton fields and the the mangroves, mangrove swamps that that are kind of like the air purifiers and the renewers of the entire planet's life support structure. If all that stops working, so does the life stop being supported. So they're saying, watch out, Uh, we're, we're overdoing the oceans, which keeps us alive, affects our weather, affects our oxygen. Number four, he says, forest overconsumption, deforestation and other changes increase the risk of malaria and cholera and open the way for new and so far unknown diseases to emerge. What he says is that, that these swampy, when you cut down the forests and then there's the runoff and then the, it goes to wasteland and there's all these pools and malaria starts and then other things are born by pests and vermin. And he just said, wow, this forest overconsumption is going to lead to diseases and epidemics. Then there's river overconsumption. The flow of rivers, the UN says, has been reduced dramatically. For parts of the year, the Great Yellow River of China, the Great Nile River of Africa, and even some of the greatest rivers in North America dry up before they reach the ocean. It's never happened before. These huge rivers are gone. They run out. They're so pulled kind of like the Jordan River uh, in Israel. It's the same way. The Dead Sea is shrinking. You get a map, the Dead Sea is now two seas. It's not one because the Jordan River is just totally sucked out before it gets to the Dead Sea. And that's on a greater scale all over the world, river overconsumption. And finally, and this is one I was having a great talk at the airport to some people about. They'd never thought of it. It's a great witnessing tool, you know. When people are reading the paper, comment, say, yeah, God said that. And they go, he did? 
What else did he say? You know, I mean, if they can read it in the newspaper, and, and uh, fish overconsumption. One-fourth of all fish stocks are over-harvested. In some areas, the catch of commercial fishermen, uh, just on Saturday, I was out there watching those huge boats come in yesterday, coming in from the North Atlantic, and it says the less than one-hundredth of what they, they harvest 1% of what they used to get when they go out. They used to just be able to put those nets down, and they could hardly lift them up. It was so full of fish. And now they put the nets down, they raise them up, and they put them down, they raise them up, and they put them down, they raise them up, and they come back. They are only getting 1% of the catch that they used to get in commercial fishing. And it's ominous. It's estimated that 90% of the total weight of the ocean's large predators, tuna, swordfish, and sharks, has disappeared in the last decade. Any of you old enough to remember going to uh, the seafood places and Red Snapper? I mean, they were almost giving it away 10 years ago. Did you know Red Snapper never stopped growing? They grow and grow and grow. And a lot of the Red Snappers that we ate up here in our restaurants in America weighed three and four and five and 600 pounds, but they were three and four and 500 years old. They've harvested all of those. Now they're only this big. And they don't live long enough to get to be half and quarter of a ton because we're over harvesting the ocean and this is changing the whole way that the predators the the whole chain within the oceans is altered because of the wholesale dragging of those commercial nets through and wiping out a whole layer so because of this the study contains a stark warning For the entire world, the wetlands, the forests, the savannas, the estuaries, the coastal fisheries, all the habitats that recycle our air and water and nutrients for every living creature on the planet are being irretrievably damaged. Here's what the report said. One species, the one that's sitting in this room, is now a hazard to the other 10 million species on the planet. How do you like that? We're the problem. But God made this for us to live in. And we're destroying it, they say. The study concludes by saying we've plundered the ocean's bounty. We've destroyed the seabed's riches. We're running out of sources of food. We're running out of fresh water. And all because of this misuse of nature, we're plunging toward the threat of killer plagues and epidemics. And the startling thing is this overconsumption is most notable in the last 60 years. Now, turn back with me to Mark chapter 13. That's Mark's record of Jesus' same sermon. The sermon John enlarges on that Matthew records. Mark captures Peter's version of it. And look what Mark 13, 29, and 30 says. Because the study concluded that the damage took place not gradually over 6,000 years of human existence. By the way, the report didn't say that. It said over millions and millions of years. But we know that's not true after two weeks ago. So over the last 6,000 years of human existence, it didn't happen in millions and millions or even 6,000 years. It took place in a single generation. That's what the report says. That's the, that's the thing that made it jump right off the Guardian. That's where I read it, the UK Guardian newspaper. It just jumped right off the page because it said this has all happened in a single generation. Look what it says in Mark thirteen twenty nine. So in like manner, when you see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass away till all these things be done. Jesus said the generation that sees and hears the hoofbeats of the apocalypse won't pass away till all these things be done. Very, very interesting. If we consider the facts carefully, if science is correct, then irreversible is the process of planetary doom, and it has begun, according to the United Nations. Well, what do we do when doom is around us? Let's turn to Lamentations 3. And I'm going to review and then introduce you to the next word. Lamentations 3, where we were looking last week. Because living in hope is Christ's plan for our life today, and that's his plan no matter what life brings today or tomorrow. Hope detaches us from the gloom that can come in life, and it can cause us to be attached to our God of hope Lamentations 3.21, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. I remember your word, Lamentations 3.21 says. The first Hebrew word that God gives us is waiting hope. It's hope that waits upon the Lord. And I I remind you that that first word that's right here in Lamentations 3.21 is most well known in Isaiah 40.31. It says, those that wait upon the Lord 
Those that that go to him to be renewed in their strength. Those that let him wrap his truth around them. Those that remember his promises. And I told you that word is like the twisting of a rope. Many weak strands come together and make it strong. So waiting hope is what God offers us. It's recharging hope. It's hope that waits till renewal comes. It's hope that renews our strength when we're exhausted. And that's the hope that God wants to give us. But secondly... Notice what it says continuing down through this passage. Through the Lord's mercies, verse 22, we're not consumed. His compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. I hope in him. The second kind of hope, not only is hope that waits, but it doesn't just wait for strength. It trusts in a person. I hope in him. We don't just hope things will get better. We don't just walk around and say, with our eyes closed, saying, I hope it gets better. We hope in him. Lamentations 3 tells us. That hope is trusting hope. Hope that produces endurance to go on. Hope that trusts until understanding comes. This is waiting when you can't see what's ahead. It's hope that makes you wait for God when you can't see where you're going. It's when you're unsure of what God's plan is. And you wait for him. Now let me show you this word in the book of Job. This is probably one of the most famous uses of this word that we're looking at. Job 13 verse 14. Turn back there. It's just four psalms. Go to the middle of your Bible. Open the psalms. And back up one book to Job 13. And I want to show you how complete God wants us to trust him. Job 13, 15. How can we apply the second type of hope the Lord offers us to our everyday lives? Job tells us in Job 13 and verse 15, this is hope that makes us wait for God when we don't know what he's doing. And this is what it says in Job 13, 15, though he slays me, yet will I, and there's that same word we saw in Lamentations, yet will I trust him. I will trust in him. Now, what what is this? The root idea of this word is to wait for something. But it means an expectant waiting under pressure. This is the word that's used all the way through the book of Job, when Job is hoping and hoping and hoping and hoping. Job was going through problems in the extreme. Most of us will never encounter what he went through. Think about his life. He lost all of his wealth. He lost all of his children. He lost all of his health. He lost most of his marriage. And all that came to him came at warp speed. I mean, it just... He lost the kids, the wealth, the health, and the wife. Just like that. Just boom. Warp speed came across his life. And it was totally unexpected. He was agonizing in pain. He was writhing in emotional duress. But through it all, he trusts God. Verse 15. Though he slay me, though my kids die, though all of my my crops and my possessions and my herds and my servants are destroyed, though I lose my health and though the dearest on earth to me is telling me to curse God and give me bad advice as his wife was. Look at verse 15. Yet I will trust him. I will trust until I understand what you're doing. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to trust in you no matter what's happening around me. This is the second type of hope. Go on to the next chapter, chapter 14. Uh, Same word of Job, Job 14, 14. If a man dies, shall he live again? This is trusting hope. This is hope that produces great endurance. Job's trusting hope anchored his soul through life's most severe storms. Look what it says at the end of Job 14, 14. All the days of my hard service, I will, and here's the same word, wait. It's the same word, yakal, same Hebrew word. It's a waiting, trusting hope when we don't know what's going on. He says, I'm not going to give up on God. This word, uh, go back to Genesis chapter 8, because this is the first time the word shows up. And this is something we can relate to even better than Job, because I've never had boils uh, or, or storms kill my children. But I have felt like Noah at times. Look at Job, I mean uh, Genesis chapter 8. Because this first time this word occurs in the Bible, it's captured by Noah's trusting hope. He was locked up in an ark. He had no way out except when God finally decided to open the door. And listen to what he says in Genesis 8, 12. This is the record. So 
he, Yaakald. The same Hebrew word. Same Hebrew word from Lamentations, the book of Job, first time Genesis 8, 12. He trusted and hoped in God. Uh, Yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him anymore. Now, wait a minute. Before you go, I want you to get this big picture. Think about trusting hope in Noah's life. If you follow the manner of God's dealings with Noah, the full strength of his faith can be seen. In verse 1 of chapter 7, God invited Noah into the ark. So that's good. He obeyed. In verse 16, God closed the door of chapter 7, verse 16. God closed the door of the ark himself. And it doesn't seem there is any way to get out of the closed ark other than jumping ship. There was only one door in and one door out, and God closed it. It doesn't seem to have a handle. and a, It's just supernatural. God sealed them in there. And they were closed in unless they jumped from the 40-foot high top of the boat out of there. It was 45 feet high. So they were closed in, and God invited them into this situation, and God closed them into the situation, and they had one thing to do inside that ark. Trust God's timing. And then... Noah waited with no messages from God for 314 days, which is 45 weeks of silence. That's from verse 11 of chapter 7. That's the 600th year of Noah's life, the second month and the 17th day when the Lord told him to get in there and he shut the door. And if you zip all the way over to chapter 8 and verse 13, that says that in the uh, first year, the first month, the first day, that's 314 days later, verse 15 says God spoke. So he was in there, sealed in, nowhere to go, trapped and waiting and trusting for 45 weeks of silence. Well, it wasn't really silent. There were all those smelly animals and probably the complaints of the kids. If you've ever been in a car, you know, on a trip, you know what it's like. But he was there. But then look at verse 15. It says, then God spoke and he says, you can go out of the ark, chapter 8, verse 15. And God opened the door and he let him go. And the only way to survive inside the ark was by trusting God. God planned the ark. God invited them in the ark. God shut the door of the ark and God was with them inside the ark. But listen, God sent the storm that they had to go through. And they had to choose whether they were going to abandon ship and take things in their own hand and get all anxious and worry, or they were just going to trust God. The hope that gives us patience and endurance of Romans 15, 4, is a hope that trusts God when we can't see where we're going when we don't know what's next, when we don't know why he put us in that situation, why he's allowing such a horrific storm to be beating against the arcs of our lives. But we don't take matters in our own hands. We trust him. Fast forward to your own life. If you're saved, God designed your boat. That's the way you travel through life, your body. He invites you into his plan, and you say, I'll obey. When you respond, he shuts you in until the ride is over. And he'll send severe storms, but he stays with us through the storm, inside the ark with us. He lives within us. He'll calm the storm. And when it's his perfect time, he opens the door and lets us out into a new world we could never have gotten to if we didn't stay with him through this process. We can either stay with the plan or jump ship. And the only way to last inside the boat of life is to live in trusting hope. What an example Noah can be to us who are going through storms and trials and adversities and disasters and upheavals and struggles in our lives. But the key is back to Jeremiah in Lamentations. He said this, This I recall to mind. Therefore I can wait. Therefore, I can trust. God's arms are open wide. He says, I want you to trust me. I'm in charge of the boat. I want you to wait for me. I'll recharge you. I'll strengthen you. Plug in. And let me give you hope. No matter what's happening, I mean, all the fish are going, the water's going, the world's going, your life is spinning. God says, trust me. Wait for me. I'm in charge of the storms. I'll open the door. And I'll see you through. Hope in me. Well, trusting hope. Waiting hope. Next time, clinging hope. 
When you don't have anything else to do, just hold on for dear life. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. I thank you, dear Father, that you are the God of hope. But I pray for some who don't understand what I'm talking about because they have never responded to your initial offer when you said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. That was a gracious offer with your outstretched arms of salvation. I hope in you because I know you, because I know that I have responded to you and that you live within me and I belong to you. But there are some here that don't share that hope that we who know you have. And I pray that today they would flee to you, O Christ. But if they do know how and they just have never cried out to you, that they will say, Jesus, I come to you. As I explained to the dear fellow this week that I had the opportunity for a divine appointment with, I told him that Jesus took his sin, which is many, just like he took my sins, which were many, and offers complete forgiveness to all who will come to him. I pray that no one today would hear of your great salvation and refuse to come. And us who know you, May you be working in us that we wait in hope, that we trust in hope, and you will see us through the even gloomier days ahead for this planet. May we hold forth the word of life and shine as a light until the day of Christ, in whose name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. 